Carson. Uh, I'm a couple of things. I'm a student at EMU's uh, School of Social Work program. I am the uh, co-director of a mentor program called A Brighter Way, and I'm the uh, owner of a farming initiative called We the People Growers Association. And on the board of Avalon Housing. I don't know how he does it all. So this workshop is on fair and affordable housing. So we, were t we had two different workshop pr proposals. We're sort of crushing them together on this one. And Melvin and I will talk a little bit about affordable housing, the, the importance and some of the strategies we can use to try to improve access to affordable housing. Any questions so far? Then he's gonna set us up by helping set the standard, the understanding of why affordable housing is an important issue. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, hi, once again, I'm Melvin. And um, i trying to, trying to tie a little bit of my experience into affordable housing and kind of like what Pam said and what Chuck will allude to a little bit later. And it made me think about uh, the first time I became homeless. Um, I was still living in Detroit. That might have been in about 2003, 2002. I moved here to Ann Arbor May the 8th of 2004. Very signature day. I still remember the day. Uh, but uh, the first time I became homeless, um, it's pretty harrowing uh, because I wasn't raised to end up being homeless, right? I was, I was raised by two wonderful parents uh, who were my grandparents and, uh, and they didn't raise me for the direction that my life ended up going in. Uh, like I said, I've, also, I've been homeless. I've also spent 13 years of my life incarcerated and I've spent many years of my life battling substance abuse. Uh, and and so uh, when I moved here to Ann Arbor, I didn't know a single person. You know, I was at a treatment center somewhere near Port Huron, and I was walking around the wonderful grounds they had out there, and something in my spirit said, whatever you want to do, Melvin, if you want to get your life together, you can't go back to Detroit, right? That's what, that's what I knew. And then three people that very same day told me about a town called Ann Arbor, so I just kind of followed that spirit, and, and here I am. Uh, but when, when I got here, I didn't, I didn't know a single soul, and, and I ended up staying at um, the Robert Delana Center, which is a homeless shelter, and uh, I became part of the uh, recovery community um, and ended up living in transitional housing for uh, a period of time, maybe about the first year and a half. Uh, and then something happened, and I became homeless again. Uh, but in that, in that period, of time, I put in an application with a wonderful organization here in town called Avalon Housing, and and so around that time, Avalon called and, and there was a a unit available for me to to live in, and um, and it was kind of there because of the affordable price that I was given and the support system that they had built into that organization. I was able to start working at getting my getting my feet up underneath me. Um, and, and I tell you, uh, for someone with a uh, minimum means of income and not really knowing what their direction of life is going to be, having this stressor of concerning themselves about rent uh, can be um, challenging, to say the least. Uh, and so Avalon Housing, because of their affordable income, allowed me not to have to concentrate so much on that or lose too much sleep about that and allowed me to focus on things like homework, right? Getting an education, you know, uh, furthering myself. So affordable housing has been very, very vital for someone like me. I'm a product of affordable housing. Uh, and I think without affordable housing and the support system that I found through that program, Avalon uh, in general, uh, I wouldn't be standing here today. So that's my story. And if you get a chance after this, talk to Melvin more, because the, what he's doing now is so incredible. Affordable housing wasn't just part of bringing him here and saving his life. It was part of saving his, the contribution he's making to the recovery community, the contribution he's making to mentorship, the contribution he's making with the food system. He's a part of saving other people's lives. So there's a ripple effect with this. So um, if we could go to the next slide. What I'm going to do very briefly is cover um, what we mean by affordable housing and some of the strategies, some of the policies we can try to use to approve it. Um, just very briefly, 
HUD, Housing and Urban Development, says that people shouldn't be paying more than 30% of their income on housing. Next slide. Now, I want to make the point that that needs to also include looking at transportation costs, too. It's not the HUD standard, but when we look at it, yeah, fine, you might be able to get a place way out in Manchester because the land's cheap there, but if you've got all that time cost, the gas cost, the, the wear and tear on your vehicle trying to get to your work, then that's not a fo an affordable situation. So the, the shift is to look towards not just housing cost, but this housing and transportation combined cost. So that means we need both a good access to affordable housing and a good transportation network to get people to where they need to go. Next slide. So how that housing, don't worry, you don't need to read the, the fine text here. How that means, you know, that 30%, they, they're saying that's for everybody. But we have people who are across an income spectrum in our community. So HUD, Housing and Urban Development, also talks about AMI, Area Median Income. They say, where's the midpoint in your community? And then for somebody who's making 80% of that midpoint, how do you, make, how do you have affordability there? If somebody's making 60%, somebody's making 30%. How do we have affordability at a range of options? Now, here in Washtenaw County, you know, some of the federal funds, they can go up for things as high as 80% AMI, but for a one-family household in Washtenaw County, 80% um, of AMI is $46,000. So you're, you're still making decent money, and you're still at that threshold that some of the federal affordable housing programs say, yes, this is affordable. Next slide, please. What this graph is, and I don't expect you to be able to read the text here, but we recently had an affordability and uh, equity analysis done for the county. And what these bar graphs are is these are how many people, what percentage of the population is paying more than 30% of their income in housing for different income ranges, right? So people making less than $20,000, of course, it's what you'd expect. It's up over 90% in Ann Arbor. But even people who are making $75,000 and up, 4% of them are... Um, house, it's called, the fancy term is housing cost constrained, right? 4% of those folks are paying too much for housing. Uh, for 50 to 75,000, it's 13% in Arbor. For 35 to 50, it's 45%. So as we look at affordable housing, it's something that occurs across a, a spectrum of issues. And we need to, and the strategies we need, need to apply are different for these different ranges. Next slide, please. So when we try to say, okay, that previous slide said that we've got a problem here. There's a lot of other data that shows we've got a problem here. Not everybody has the same opportunities that Melvin talked about, being able to find that, that unit when you need it. What is it going to take for Ann Arbor, the city of Ann Arbor, to do its share to address this affordability problem? And over the next 20 years, we need to add 2,800 new units of affordable housing. 2,800. It's a huge number. It's a huge number. The, re the consultants, you know, we just talked about fair housing. Our consultants said, in, we're not talking student housing here. A student might be temporarily income eligible because they're not making a lot of money washing dishes or whatever, but that's not the population we're trying to target when we say we need more fee affordable housing. Um, so what are some of the, what is our toolbox? Let me, before I get into our toolbox, when I saw this number, it was it was a big wake-up call for me because a lot of the ways we've been trying to address this affordable housing problem have been a few units here, a few units there. You know, it was over a decade ago that um, Avalon Housing built Karen Way, Carrot Way up on the north side of town, and that was a knockdown drag out for, what, 100 units or so? 35, only 35 units. <laughs> so, if, and if we're having a knockdown drag out once a decade for 35 units, we're never going to hit this number. We've got to expand our toolbox. We've got to have, be looking at more ways to hit that number. Next slide. One way is to increase supply. Um, the pick, so some of this is market force. We, we can't afford to have subsidized housing for all that 30, uh, 2,800 units. The picture that's up there is the development that's been, uh, recently approved for Nixon Road. That's a market rate unit, and it can be financed out for 80% AMI. 80% of the area median income. Now again, 30% 80% AMI, that's still people making good money in Ann Arbor. It's not, we're not, this isn't poverty housing. The, the hope is that by taking some of the pressure off that part of the market, it helps with some of the workforce housing a little bit lower than that. Th so this is part of the strategy, but this is never gonna solve our problem for people who are low income and very low income in our community. It's 
part of the toolbox, but we, it's not all the toolbox. Next slide, please. One of the strategies, too, uh, kind of the supply side, how do we help um, address, open up some new units is what are called accessory dwelling units. Taking, you know, housing used to be built with this. They'd have the carriage house or the, or the maybe a, an apartment above the garage or things like that so that there was housing, even in single-family neighborhoods, that, um, you know, the servants' quarters kind of thing that was more affordable. There's a proposal to expand that in Ann Arbor so people could convert their garage, convert, you know, add an, a small addition to their house, and have another little unit there. There's two affordability benefits to this. One is those units are generally smaller. There's going to be a probably around 800 square foot limit on how big those could be. Smaller units, rent is just lower. Second, so, there, so we're looking at a little bit of an affordability benefit there. The second affordability benefit is I hear from people who are saying, I want to stay in my home, but I'm getting on in years. I can't, you know, the, I'm not sure I'll be able to keep paying the util taxes and utilities with uh, retirement income. I can't get the, the drive shoveled anymore. So a homeowner who's able to put in this accessory dwelling unit, it helps make their primary unit, or maybe they'll move into the accessory dwelling, but it helps make them stay in their homes. The other, but again, back to that continuum, these aren't going to reach people who are at the very bottom of that continuum, the v very low income, unless it's a situation where I'm going to put in this accessory dwelling unit so I can take care of my cousin who's in recovery, my ailing parent, uh, my child with a disability, and it makes financial sense for me to do this addition because I know that if the situation changes, it'll still be a potential rental. The money makes it. So is that family connection where somebody's providing support for a family member, that's probably the only chance where these are going to help the very bottom of that income um, range. Next slide, please. All right. Um, the next strategy we have are affordability incentives. There's a lot of sort of technical wonky stuff I could get into with this, but the the building that's up there is, I always forget the name of it, it's Corner House Lofts. It's the building where Buffalo Wild Wings is in downtown Ann Arbor. When that developer came to city council, um, I'm on city council now, but this was before I was on council, um, they, the zoning didn't work for them. So they said, we want, some, we want you to do something else with this site. We want you to do what's called a planned unit development. And the negotiation is they were allowed to put in certain, they said, okay, we'll put a number of affordable units in this development. Um, there's, that's one way to do it. There's other ways to do it too. Right now in our downtown, we allow a, an affordable housing premium. So we say, if you put affordable units in your building, we'll let it build bigger. Yeah, you know, something we could consider expanding to other transportation corridors too. Another way that this can be done is, um, by using sometimes when a uh, polluted site or a otherwise distressed site is redeveloped, there's some tax funding financing that can come through for brownfields. That's another potential incentive that can sort of sweeten the pot. Say, okay, we'll give you this brownfield funding if you have an affordability component to it. So there actually are affordable. Yes, but one of the things we learned as we went as we've gone through this process is we need to set up the rules for this very carefully, because if we just say they need to be income qualified, they need to be below that 60% or 80% area median in income, a grad student can come along and say, hey, look, I'm a student, I'm not making any money, I qualify. So making sure that there's some agreement so that it's, that the affordable units are being, they're taking them off the Section 8 list, the, the housing voucher list, or they're working with a provider like Avalon, so that the affordable units are going to the people we want to reach not just, some, not just a business school student who, during their education, may not be, may, may be income qualified. Um, next slide, please. There's a catch here. And this was a catch that we didn't know about when we created the Corner House Lofts Agreement. And there's a state law that says a local unit of government cannot pass any ordinance or resolution that would affect the amount of money a landlord charges for rent unless the, that unit of government has a property interest in the property. So we can do something for, if it's owner-occupied, we can say, okay, let's put a deed restriction on it. If it's rental, it's very, very difficult for us. There's some very convoluted ways we've met, thought of to try to get around it. But it's very difficult to, to say, okay, straight up, you can rent it. We've got this thing. In fact, there's a proposed development on the corner of Maine and Madison 
where initially the developer was saying, hey, I want to go a little bit taller here and I want to provide some affordable units to make that happen. And because of this law and some other neighborhood opposition to the building height and stuff, that wasn't able to move forward. Okay, so the law says, so it was an anti-rent control law. The legislature didn't want a community like Ann Arbor saying, we're going to cap rent and we're going to restrict the, how much any landlord can charge for rent. They wrote it in such a broad way that there's nothing we can do if, unless we have a property interest to restrict how much a landlord can do. So even these things where we said, okay, we're going to make a trade for you, we'll let you build a bigger building, or we'll let you give you the zoning uh, clearance if you give some affordable units, that's in a gray area where it's m difficult to enforce because the anti-rent control law is so broad. So some of those tools I just described in, in terms of incentives and premiums and brownfields are very difficult to use. So one of the things we need to do is we need to get this law changed. Our Washtenaw County Legislative Assembly, you know, Jeff Irwin and Rebecca Warren and Dave Rutledge, they're all on board with this. But if they go to Lansing and say, hey, we've got this idea from Ann Arbor, they're going to get, nobody's going to sign on. So we need to build a statewide coalition with com other communities that are having this problem, like Grand Rapids and Traverse City, to get that law changed. Next slide, please. Um, for, was anybody in the room here a little bit ago about tiny houses? So Mission, I'm, they're, they're the ones who know what's going on here. I wanted to give them the credit. They are looking at how to use tiny houses as an opportunity to address affordable housing. They're looking at targeting that very low income people, you know, people's stories like Melvin's. Um, for that, this picture on your right is a tiny house community in Olympia, Washington, where they did just that. And so getting the support to address the, both the local and the state hurdles to try to make that happen is another tool in the toolbox. Next slide. Another strategy is to use public land for affordable housing. There's two ways we can do that. The picture on the left is just across the street here. It's on Platte Road. It's the former site of the Washington County Juvenile Detention Facility. That building's bulldozed. It's not there anymore. What happens to the land? There's a vision that some of us have been championing to say, let's put affordable housing there. As we went through the sort of community dialogue about how to make that work, it's gotten, now the vision is a mixed income housing, um, but let's put a mixed income housing there. And much like Carrot Way, it's been a knockdown drag out to get support for that. So, but using that public land is one way to get affordable housing. Um, the picture on your right is a picture of the old, the library lane parking lot. That's, okay. Um, it's just a parking lot. It's not a very pretty picture. Uh, just north of the library. Yeah, downtown Ann Arbor. Um, so one proposal has been to say, okay, let's sell the development rights for library lane and then take that, take a portion of that money and use it for affordable housing. So those are two different ways we can use public land to address affordable housing. One is to put the housing right on it. The other is to sell the land and use the revenue from that to provide affordable housing. I put up library lane there because right now we're in a process of trying to look at options for selling that. And the, it's, it's hard to sell city owned land. It requires an eight vote, eight of, eight of 11 super majority. Right, so it takes a, there's a very high standard to, th to sell city land. I don't think the proposal that's on the table is gonna get eight votes. It might, it might not. You, if, you, if you like the proposal, tell city council members you like it. If you don't, tell city council members not to let the process stop here, but to keep trying to use that public land to address this affordable housing piece. I'll cover that again when we get to action steps at the end. Um, next slide, please. Here's an, another strategy that would help is to treat housing choice vouchers, Section 8 vouchers, as income. There's a situation where you can come to a landlord, a landlord will say, okay, one of our requirements is we need to make sure you've got enough money to pay your rent. And you say, okay, I've got this job as a substitute teacher, and I've got this Section 8 voucher, I've, I've got the income to pay the rent. But right now in Michigan, they don't need to treat that Section 8 voucher as income 
And so they can say, yes, yeah, so we, you've got proof you can pay the rent, but we're still not going to rent it to you because you don't, you don't make enough money for us. What's on the slide, the, the states in orange are states that have re- state regulations already to treat uh, voucher income at, voucher as income and to prevent discrimination based on source of income in that way. And one of the things that has been talked about is for Ann Arbor to pass a local ordinance to that same effect. Uh, next slide. So one of the game-changing things that I think would really make a difference in the housing affordability is if we just had money for it. I, mean, I want to make sure I'm on the right side. If we just had money for it. right? We have a state, so we have a city a property tax to fix their sidewalks. We have a city property tax to buy uh, open space outside of Ann Arbor. We have a city property tax, to, actually a county property tax, to help pay for our emergency response um, telecommunication system. We have, a, we have a property tax to fix our roads. We have a lot of property taxes to solve a lot of specific needs. We don't have anything that covers affordable housing. This is, that's a great question. This is, that's why I'm putting this up here is because one of the things that I think would be gr- fantastic is people have been talking about this for decades. But to start the work of pulling together a coalition, do that work, figure out what is it going to take, how are we going to do it, and put together a, a campaign to pass something like that. Right, I don't have an answer for you because right now, everything I've heard about this has just been at the wouldn't that be great level. And that's all I can provide for you today. But, I, but it's going to take some help. It's going to need some hard work and some policy work to, to come up with a specific proposal. Right. What was that, a million or something like that? Mm-hmm. Um, is that something that's actually uh, okay. enforceable? Right. So the city, the city of Ann Arbor, the Washtenaw County, and the city of Ann Arbor Downtown Development Authority all are providing allocations for affordable housing and or safety net services. So the city of Ann Arbor has been putting money in each year in our budget to try to address this. A lot of that money recently has gone into trying to fix up our, our housing commission properties. We're in awful shape. So we were going through this major renovation of all of our properties to make them worth living in. And so we've spent a lot of money on that. Um, And so right now that that affordable housing fund that we've been putting money into, for example, when we sold the YMCA property, we put the the proceeds from that into our affordable housing fund, that's gone. Now, this is why the changing it to a millage would be a game changer, because right now it depends on having the flexibility in our budget to put some money aside or having sales of city-owned parcels to put aside, it's not an ongoing, dependable revenue stream. Um, It's these small one-off allocations and a little bit in each budget to try to cover that. So to to take it to the next level of an ongoing revenue stream would be a game changer. Next slide. Uh, another game-changing strategy would be to allow inclusionary zoning. So for those of you who can't read, the, read the, sli- uh, the picture there, if you don't already live in this town, you probably can't afford to. The story of Ann Arbor. I don't know what, where this actually came from. I should, but it's, it wasn't here. Some communities have laws that say it's called, in, our, our zoning right now is de facto exclusionary. All the stuff that's coming up in downtown, unless they've made an agreement with us and nobody has recently, is market rate and it's expensive and there's no, sp- there's no room in the inn for people who are low income or very low income. Some communities like Chicago and Portland and others require what they call inclusionary zoning. So they say, okay, you're going to build a 100-unit apartment complex, 10% of those need to be affordable. This would be a game changer. It needs, and I think it, it would need, it would be, it, we, we would probably, it would be a fight, it might be a fight to get it in Ann Arbor, but it, at this point it's academic because we don't have a state law that allows it. Um, so next slide and next slide. 
So if you have a cell phone, uh, I want you to go to connectandact.org slash act before you leave this room. And there's going to be links on there to contact the Ann Arbor City Council and the Washtenaw County Board of Commissioners. You can tell the Washtenaw County Board of Commissioners to make sure they keep going on ensuring that there's affordable housing on the Platte Road site. And you can tell the Ann Arbor City Council members to support accessory dwelling units and to keep moving on ensuring that somehow Library Lane does more than just house cars, but it helps provide affordable housing for people. Which is the next slide. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the two sides. Yeah, the, I was, the other side was, do it now. If you've got a phone, do it now. Okay. So midterm actions. Yes, supporting Mission Ann Arbor's work on tiny houses is something. And so you connect with them. Um, they're here. Uh, that is something that you can, we can do in a more intermediate term piece. And then I'm also going to make a plug for ICPJ's Racial and Economic Justice Task Force with Mary and Lucia. I probably... Should have checked with them before I put some of these ideas up there. But if ICPJ is, is one of the potential work groups working on trying to push for some of these local law changes, and so that's a group that's working on it. And that, oh, and longer term actions last slide is um, looking at some of these state changes uh, to allow inclusionary zoning and to make sure that we've got the ability to have affordable housing incentives. The one thing I want to make a specific plug, plug on those affordable housing incentives is that right now, like I said, the Ann Arbor delegation is on board. We need allies from across the state. So one of the ways that you, you can help make that possible is if you could just go through your network. Does your congregation have other uh, churches or synagogues other place in other parts of the state where they've got supportive people who might be willing to tell their elected officials, hey, Let's allow these affordable housing uh, incentives. Building that network, not just in Washington County, but across the state, is going to be part of what is, we're going to need to get some of these state-level changes made. So that was a lot of information. We're going to, we've got a couple minutes for questions and comments. So I'm going to take, just because I've heard from you, Mo, Ron, Lucia, and then Mo. So nothing stands in the way. What Albert was talking, so for those of you who don't know, Albert Bretz is the CEO of McKinley Property. They own a lot of property in Washtenaw County and around the country. And he was specifically talking about workforce housing, so 60 to 120% of AMI. He's not in the business of, he wasn't interested in that below 60% low income housing. So yes, using, um, for example, one property he's, you know, the parking lot over by the uh, farmer's market at the corner of 4th and Ann, housing could go there. The city owns properties west of Ashley Street, sort of behind, or by Ashley, you know, sort of behind Connor O'Neill's. We own property there. Those are other sources where we might be able to put ho either put housing or sell it and use the money for housing or some combination, you know, have some sort of mixed income thing like they're talking about across the street. There's no legal barrier to it. One barrier we are facing right now is a capacity barrier, trying to get where, okay, how many of these trying to sell a property projects can we have at a, at a time? So hope that's one of the reasons I hope that we can reach some sort of resolution with the library lane lot. So we can say, okay, library lane, check, it's done, something's happening there. What's next? What's next? We can't do them all at once, but move through that process on that, I think, would be a useful thing. Lucia? That's a technical question. If they, uh, the places where they allowed housing vouchers to be counted as income, how do they not then try to collect income tax on that one? How does that work? 
So, so the way that that policy is is what is telling landlords it's not it, for other uses. It's not saying this is income, but it's telling a landlord that you have to treat the housing voucher as income. So if you're trying to say you need to make X dollars for this site, you know this is our income threshold. To say um, there's we're saying the housing voucher counts as income for the purpose of that calculation. You know, I'm not, I don't know the specific details about how that has been implanted. And you had a, your hand up anyway, so. I'm just going to throw this in as a wacky idea. Is there a reason why the city bends it in high income and then use the revenues from that to build other things? I don't so, that. right. And that, that's actually been one of the things that's been, some people have t talked about uh, for Library Lane. If we don't get a, if we don't have the eight votes to build the proposal that would get a $10 million sales price and $5 million into affordable housing, if we don't have the votes for that, maybe we try to work, find a developer who would be willing to have some market rate, some affordable. We keep an ownership interest so that it's ongoing revenue stream and we get, we get the mix. Part of the challenge is, well, I'll, be, I'll also be blunt, the city's record of being able to do real estate deals is atrocious. Um, partly because of that eight vote, partly because people are changing all the time. So, and it's not our area of expertise. So it would be, we would need a really good partner to be able to pull together all of the things where, and we would need to be a good partner, a better partner than we sometimes have been, um, to be able to say, yes, it's worth, you, it's worth your time to, to work with us on this because we're really going to do it and we need you to do it. But it is something that people have considered. Off the top of my head, I don't know. Do you know, I mean, do you know if there's very many, or if there's like one? Or there, there, there are a variety of houses that, are, that have an affordability component and are senior housing. Uh, for example, Courthouse Square Apartments on 4th yeah, Avenue. 52 and over. It's 55 and over, yeah. right. I, I'm talking about the 60. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, is that just people who want to right. live in Ann Arbor, or what is that? It's, it's back to that slide of showing how everybody's housing cost constraint. It's not just for the 62 and up. It's all of our affordable units have a tremendous waiting list. Uh, folks remember back in November, I think it was, there was a, a bike accident. Uh, somebody was biking home from work at like 2 in the morning uh, on his way to Pittsfield Township and was killed, hit and run death. For me, that's a, an affordable housing thing, right? And as a transportation thing, he died because he, could, he, he didn't, couldn't afford a car or he couldn't afford the parking, and he couldn't afford a house close enough to be able to have other transportation. So he had to be biking in the middle of the night on a busy road, and he got killed, right? So, and he was, he was a young guy. He was in his 20s or 30s. So it's, it's young people, it's old people, it's everybody. And just like Melvin had the story of affordable housing saving his life, I see that death as the lack of affordable housing costing people's lives. So it is absolutely an urgent thing. Mary's going to have the last question, and then we've got to clear out so the next group can come in. So the short story on the federal side, and I, I didn't cover some the federal side, partly because I look at Washington and I cry. <laughs> um, what's been happening with affordable housing funding from D.C. is it's been going down and down and down. Um, and so changes like that change would be 
tremendous. Changes like making sure that the how they fund public housing actually covers the cost to maintain it would be huge. But right now, it's you look at D.C., it's pretty depressing, which is why I wanted to try to focus on our local solutions. I want to thank you all for coming. I want to encourage you to take some of those actions. If we could go back a couple slides to the immediate actions piece. 